Okay. Okay. So today we are going to do some uh, review about the basic chemistry analysis that will be uh, used in uh, in the future class. Uh, so first, like when we was young, we learned chemistry. But I guess some of you guys also learn chemistry in in our university. So I will uh, review some definitions in chemistry, and then uh, we use. Um, like what's, how can we quantify uh, the amount of substance so I will go through the modes and concentrations and then solutions are very common in the environmental science so I will go through some more details about the solutions and uh, for the solution and for the quantitative analysis we need to do the uh, unit conversion so I will go through some of the units and unit conversion and then I will talk about two important principles in chemistry and environmental science, uh, which are these two. Uh, actually, I only show one. And another one is, I, I forgot his name, it's a French name. Uh, and the sixth one is about the quantitative analysis in chemistry. So I will go through some of the uh, store chemistry and limiting reagents, fields, and pH. Uh, so, uh, so first, first uh, let's uh, review let's some terminologies. Um, so, so for <coughs> first one, we know the atomic, atomic weight. weight. It refers it to the average of weight of atoms in an element. And here shows some of the common elements in our daily life. So do you guys remember what's the atomic weight of iron? Uh, it is 56. And the carbon? It is 65. Actually, Actually they are not common. <laughs> <laughs> but the points, um, OK, let me just turn this off. OK, the points I want to show that we have diamonds. So if we consider diamonds as carbon, so the uh, atomic weight of carbon is 12. And we and determine the atomic weight based on this one. So we need to remember um, this one. And then for the elemental composition, it refers to um, all the elements that in a compound. For example, we have one dash chlor chlorobutane, which the chemical structure is here. We can see that it has three uh, elements. And for the molecular formula, um, it shows how many atoms of each element. So it provides more information than element composition. And the same example, the chemical formula is like this. And for the molecular weight, it means sum of the masses of all atoms together. And for the same example, we can calculate um, the molecular weight of this one dash butane. And we can see that it is a clear uh, liquid. <coughs> and for the property of the matters, so I think we know that the matter is defined as anything that um, has both mass and take up space. And for the properties, they are used to categorize or describe or identify the matter. And the two important concepts are here. Intensive properties has a value that do not depend on the amount of substance. And the extensive properties has a value <coughs> that uh, depends on the amount of substance. And we can see on some of the examples, I just find some random pictures from the Google image. And we can see like boiling points, color, temperature, luster, hardness. They are intensive properties. So if we have so many of these substances, it will not change. And for the extensive properties like volume, mass, size, weight, and length. And similarly, this shows another picture. And we also have like temperature, boiling points, concentration, luster, weight, length, volume. And we can see that based on these two random pictures, all of them has like the volume and length, I think. So it means these two, cons these two examples are the most important ones. Uh, so, so far, do you guys have any questions? No? And I have two questions for you. So what about price? Do you guys think price is the intensive or extensive? 
expensive. Uh, why? Because the more you have of something, the, the, the price may increase. The price may increase. But I was also thinking like if I have two things and I sell them, the price will be lower than two times the price. Sometimes. Mm-hmm. Like because mm-hmm. we have a discount. Right. So do you guys have any other ideas? Or it's, it's hard to determine. Okay. And the second one is, what about difficulty? Like, we have exams, then, and one exam is very difficult, and I have two exams. Do you think difficulty will increase or will not change? Thinking of certain amount of time. Um, <laughs> it's it's a Let's say your time will be doubled. It's also hard to decide. Yeah. So here I want to show two points. Um, so first one, let's talk about the, my example is that the difficulty of the exam. But we need to think, is exam a method? I think exam is a more abstract stuff. So exam is not a method, which means we cannot use difficulty to describe, or we can use difficulty to describe exam, but difficulty, but exam itself is not a matter. So this question is not valid because exam is not a matter. And the second point is that what I call price. And here, when I was preparing for this, we can find this in Wikipedia. And then if we scroll it down, we can find the limitations. Maybe it is too small. Um, but we can see that, so this classification has some problems. So let's just say like this sentence, or maybe let's just say the last sentence. Like for some intensive properties, do not apply at, oops. <laughs> oh, it's just go sleep. Uh, I'm sorry for that. So we can see that um, do not apply at very <coughs> small size, for example, viscosity. So uh, some of the scientists mentioned that those, this uh, classification method may not be applied to all of the properties. So this classification has some limitations. So this is a point I want to show. So let's save this photo. OK. Yes. Uh, so these two concepts are important, but we also need to know that they have some limitations. Um, so uh, we want to quantify the amount of the substances. So I think the most famous one in the mole, and we know that mole refers to a Pokemon, mm-hmm. and this Pokemon can use the Earth magic. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> so uh, here are the points. So one mole of the atoms is defined as the number of atoms which expect exactly 12 grams of isotope mass of C12. So this is a, a carbon atom that has 12 uh, a- atomic weight. Actually, when I was searching for uh, C12, and I got this two results. And I think this is a particle of mass, <laughs> and this is a smartphone. And finally, I got this one. So this is C12, which is dark. And uh, the number is called Avogadro number. And uh, so this is cute. But we need to remember, <laughs> it, it's good to remember this number. And uh, the, the way that I remember this number is that every day I get up at 6 and go bed at 12, uh, at 10 PM, and uh, sleep at 11 PM. But you guys may have your own ways to remember this number. And the next thing is about concentration. Uh, so um, as engineers and environmental science, we are often interested in the concentration of some chemicals in water, soil, and or air, and or the composition of the construction uh, materials. 
and we express the amount of chemical per unit volume. So like we can use dilute or concentrated to describe the amount of salt uh, in a solution, but it is not accurate. Like different people may have different standards. And I also want, so we can see this solution is very salty. And actually when I come to United States, I know that salty can be used to describe a person. <laughs> um, so next one is about concentration units. Um, the first one is uh, molarity. We can use m or mole per liter, <coughs> and this refers to the number of moles of a specific species per liter of solution. And another one is molarity. And so this is mole per uh, kilometer kilogram and we have this um, because um, like it is good when we do not want to worry about change in volume in terms of change of uh, temperature or pressure because for the gas that it is very sensible to this parameter and we also have normality uh, we can use n or equivalent per liter or like sometimes we also use eq per liter so in chemistry, the equivalent concentration of normality in the solution is defined as the molar concentration divided by an equivalent factor. So usually, it is usually in acid and base um, redox and the precipitation reactions. For example, for the uh, sulfuric acid, because we consider it as acid, it can give 2H plus. So the equivalent factor is two. So a uh, 0 0.01 molar H2SO4 equals to 0 to 0 0.02 uh, equivalent in acid. And here's another example. Like, I think this is looks better than KFC last time, right? <laughs> uh, so I like chicken wings. <laughs> and uh, so for me, 0 0.01 molar of chicken equivalent to 0 0.02 of chicken wings because each chicken has two wings. Um, and we also have the mole fraction, which is defined as the mole of the species of interest, of, of interest divided by the total mole of the species. Uh, so far, do you guys have any questions? No? And then let's talk ab more about solutions. Uh, so in chemistry, a solution is a special type of homogeneous mixture. And the keyword is homogeneous. It must be homogeneous. A uh, composition of two or more uh, substances. And here are some terminologies like solution, solvents, and solute. Solvent is a major component. So it is usually the water or organic solvent. And we also have the solute. And, and the solution can be in almost any state, like solid dissolved in liquid, like coffee or tea, and uh, like the liquid in liquid, like alcohol, and gas in liquid, like the soda, and solid dissolved in solid, like the alloy. And we also have the air, which is gas dissolved in uh, air. And for the units of solutions, I think the one that we usually see is ppm. And here shows a picture of CO2 concentration uh, in the atmosphere that changed with time. We can see that uh, it used ppm. And we can also see that in about uh, last year, the CO2 concentration is kind of like 400 ppm. And we can see What's the concentration of CO2 in our classroom now? I can show you this. So we can see it's pretty high. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we can also see that the PM, PM 2.5 and PM 10, they are okay. Yeah, so let's see if they, it will further increase. 
And so PPM generally refers to the um, part per million is a weight to weight ratio. But it can also be used as a volume to volume ratio because um, the density of water is one. But as I think not here, this um, unit is not recommended. I, I will mention why. <coughs> okay, so uh, let's talk about more of the units. So we have the mass to mass units. And for mass to mass units, we can use PPM, but this PPM is different. We use the mass here. So it specified this is a mass to mass uh, unit. And it refers to the mass fraction equals to 10 to the 6. Mm -hmm. And we also have like PPB and the PPT and the, the intuity uh, volume ratio is something like this. And we also have the unit uh, for solutions for uh, volume to volume. And correspondingly, we have this PPM with B. So if you guys use the PPM, I recommend you guys to specify if this the mass to mass or volume to volume. That's why the PPM itself is not recommended. Uh, yes, and the volume to volume is usually used for the gas concentration because when we compress the gas, the, the relative volume will not change, uh, as shown here. Um, and the air concentration can also express as milligram per cubic meter. And then um, for more units, we also have the mass to volume units which is milligram per liter. I think this is the most commonly used uh, unit in environmental science. And we also know that one cubic meter equals to 1,000 liter. Uh, so um, this is commonly used in aqueous concentration and in aqueous dilution system. And uh, this volume is e like the PPMM is equivalent to milligram per liter. And we can remember this uh, unit conversion. And because the density of water is this. And then we also have the mole to volume unit. And this is commonly used to report concentration of compounds and dissolved in water. And this is a little bit important. So, and I think we have mentioned this before. So uh, the unit of mole per liter is called molarity, and it can, we can use M to express that. And then another one I want to um, focus on molarity. So this is commonly used uh, in the water constituents. And uh, if we have two chemicals that we have A and B, they react they have the same strength or equivalent basis, then the ratio is one to one. Uh, but in acid and in acid base of chemistry, the number of equivalent or moles of acid equals to the number of moles of H plus. So the important thing is this H plus. And so, for example, as I mentioned before, the sulfuric acid, so the factor is two. And similarly, this is one. This is also two, and this is one, and blah, blah, and this should be three. And the point I want to show that we also have some organic acids. So for example, this one, do you think what's the equivalent factor of this lactic acid? Do anyone have any ideas about this one? Two. Two? Yeah. <coughs> so if we want to determine this one, we need some knowledge in organic chemistry. Because in organic chemistry, this one will not dissociate H+. Plus. Only this one will dissociate H+. Plus. I, I will talk about this in the organic chemistry unit, but we can be aware of this one. So this one is one instead of two. And we also have some other organic chemicals shown here. And, uh, Normality is very useful for treatment 
for industrial waste. Uh, so far, do you guys have any questions? No? Okay. Um, so, um, let's talk about the two important principles uh, in chemistry and environmental science. And the first one is mass conservation. So mass is never created or destroyed in chemical reactions. And we have two inferences. And the first one is that a different sample of pure chemical substances always contain the same portion of the element by mass. And the second one is for the chemical reaction. That for the uh, chemical reaction, we only rearrange the way of atoms are combined. But the, the atoms themselves are not changed. So before the chemical reaction, we have four um, oxygen atoms. And after the reaction, we still have four uh, oxygen atoms. But for the nuclear reaction, it, it will change. And so this is the expression of mass conservation in chemistry. And we also have the expression of mass conservation in physics. And this is the fixed law. And then um, the second um, principle is the Chatelier's the principle. I think this is a French name. <laughs> yeah, and so, but before I talk about this, the Chatelier's LC, LC principle, <laughs> I will, let's talk about equilibrium first. Uh, so equilibrium is uh, reached when the uh, reactant at a point where the combination of the re reactant to form product is just balanced by the reverse reaction of product combining to form the reactant. So equilibrium is used to describe a reversible chemical reaction. And uh, <coughs> so it means that the rate of A and B generates C and D equals to the rate of C and D generates A and B. So it reaches an uh, equilibrium. Equilibrium, and actually, when I say equilibrium, it just reminds me of the equilibrium in economics. And I think this uh, equilibrium of the free market. And when I see these plots, I think in chemistry, the equilibrium is is easier. So I learn chemistry. <laughs> um, then let's talk about LC principle. And for reaction at equilibrium, uh, it will adjust itself in such a way to release any force or stress that disturbs the equilibrium. So we can ask a question like, what happens when you add product to the solution? So if we add more A into this reaction, then C and D will increase, because um, the system wants to decrease amount of A, because we add more A. And what happens if you remove the product from the solution? Like if we remove D, then a and B will also decrease because we want to generate more D to compensate this loss. And I think it's also applied in, in economics. Like if the apple is very expensive, then more farmers will gr gr grow the apple trees and the price of apple will decrease. But not for this apple because it, is, it has no competitors, I guess. Um, then for more about equilibrium, we use the equilibrium constant describe the equilibrium. And the equilibrium constant is defined as this. So basically, it is the product over reactant. But this is the concentration of the product. This is a coefficient in front of it. And then we, we put them together and uh, find the product. And here's an example. We have this N204. Uh, it is a reversible reaction to form an O2. And here is an O2. The, the color is, looks good. And so the um, equilibrium constants of this reaction can be expressed as this. So we have a 2 here because the coefficient is 2. And uh, so it, it, it equals to this one. So we can measure uh, this in, in the lab. Oh. So far, do you guys have any questions? Slowing down just a little bit. I can't keep up with my notes. Oh, so like, can you release these afterwards? Yeah, I will okay. upload these on Canvas. Okay. 
Yeah, I, I will be slower. I'm sorry. <laughs> Are more questions? Okay. Um, the next one is about stoic. Oops. Mm, something wrong with the connection. And the next one is about, um, so if we want to do the calculation between the grams of reactants to the gram of products, we cannot calculate them directly. So we cannot go through them directly. We need to um, convert it into moles and use a mole as a bridge to calculate the grams of products. And here is an example. And because of time, I will go through this example. Uh, I like I will record a video, go through this, this example, and I will upload it on Canvas. So it shows the calculation. And finally, I will talk about three um, concepts, like the limiting reagent, yield, and pH. For the limiting reagents, because uh, the reactants, they, do, they may not have the perfect ratio. Like for each slice of bread, for two slices of bread, we need one piece of cheese. But um, if we only have two pieces of cheese, but we have so many of bread, then we have some leftovers. So uh, the cheese is a limiting reagent. And we, we also know the yield. So yield is defined as the actual product yield divided by the theoretical product yield. Because in reality, we cannot have all of the reactant be transferred into the product. So this is always less or equal to one. But, but it cannot equal to one. So this should be less than one. And the last thing I want to talk about is pH. So here is a definition of pH. So it is, this is a concentration of H plus. And then we take the log 10. And then we take the minus. And this is as pH. And here I have two questions. So what's the pH of a DI water? Seven? Okay. When I was young, I also gave this answer. And we will answer this question in assignment one. I think this will be the last question. So after that, you, you can know this does not equal to seven. And I will talk more about this in uh, unit two, about the water, or unit three in water chemistry. We will do the calculation about the pH of the air water. And the next one is, what if, if I heat up the water that has pH equals to seven? Like if I have a water that pH equals to seven, if I heat it up, Will pH change? No. Because there's something else in it. Uh, assume it is pure. No. Actually, it will increase. Okay. No. <laughs> because if we heat up the water, uh, the water will di dissociate more H plus. So the concentration of H plus will increase. Because H plus will increase, then the pH will increase. Even though the water is also neutral, but the pH will increase. So this pH equals to seven refers to neutral only applied for the room temperature. Uh, so do you have any questions? No? Okay. So I think that's, that's the end of this. And here I have some um, blanks, but because of time, so I think you guys can look through it after class, I will upload this slide uh, after class. And uh, yeah, so on, on Tuesday, next Tuesday, we will have lecture three. And you guys can start to assignment one and Christmas. And I think some of you have done Christmas. And then uh, Maria will introduce that too.
So do you want to use this? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, right. Do you have the slides? Yes. So if you want to write, you can just write, okay. and you can. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll make sure that she's not shy. Thank you. <laughs> okay, guys. Um, some of you met me yesterday at the teaching lab. I'm Maria Rodriguez. I'm a PhD student at this department, and I will be your TA for some units of this class. Um, in September, I will be here in person, but uh, I'm traveling to the Amazon rainforest to do field work for my thesis, so most of my uh, coordinations with you conversations will be on Zoom in the next units, okay? But I'm here this month, I think. So, okay, so I'm going to introduce today the lab that we will do next Wednesday. So this lab is related to the uh, water crisis that happened in Flint. I hope you have watched uh, some videos posted on Elms, and maybe you have read the lab protocol for next week, oh, cool. So I will need your help with this, so I'm going to ask you some questions. So who can tell me what happened in Flint? Like um, briefly, general, okay. Uh, generally speaking, they initially drained water from the lake from that provided by Detroit. They took over to the Flint River in the process um, due to sort of different treatments needed for Flint River. Um, they ended up creating a compound issue where like corrosion and types of pollution into the water. So what kind of things they had in the water? Um, so the, uh, the Flint River, unlike the Detroit water system, had a bacterial issue where they needed to add additional chlorine um, to, to treat it. Um, however, in the process, they also failed to subdevelop, I think it's like oxygen, no, it's like oxygen chlorine or something. Yeah, we <laughs> But they stopped okay. treating it with that. But then these three chlorine ions started interacting with the, lead, the ions in lead pipes, um, leading to the corrosion and then eventual placement of the lead on the water as well. Okay, so they had metal, they have metals in the drinking water, right? And what do you think this is an issue, to have metals in the drinking water? Because lead in general deteriorates water in the humans, and it's not just if you ingest it, but also like if you were to in, like, inhale the water vapor, it can cause some like, extreme stiffness, and the county also just did not care. They kind of like tried to cover it up by doing different water testing that would like, they flushed the toilet before they actually tested uh -huh. it, so it wouldn't show. Okay, cool, so you know a lot <laughs> about this already. So, okay, so as you said that this problem started in uh, 2013 when they were buying, the Flint City were buying the, the water from Detroit, and Detroit was treating the water very good, they have a good quality, they have all the um, treatments recommended by EPA and everything, but they wanted to save money, so they decided to change and they wanted to buy water from another authority called, it has a like, difficult name for me, Corinne Dane, something like that. <laughs> and but this uh, new authority, uh, it wasn't ready to, to deliver the water to Flint because they needed to build a, a new pipe. So while they were uh, building this pipeline, uh, Flint decided to uh, take the water from Flint River, as your uh, partner said. And um, this, uh, they decided to treat the water by themselves, but they didn't do a very nice job with that. So after the switching, the residents in Flint started to see red color in the water, like a weird taste. And a year after that, in summer uh, 2014, the city issued uh, an alert about Echerichia coli. This is a pathogen, a bacteria in the water and that bacteria can cause several diseases in humans. So they uh, issue and boil advisory, so people needed to boil the water to get rid of this bacteria, and they decided to add more bleach to kill this bacteria. But they have another problem, that the Flint River water quality was very bad. So I don't know if you watched one of the videos posted, there was a lady saying that you could find cars in the river, like they use the river as a trash can or something. So they had a lot of uh, garbage in the river. So, and this means a uh, high natural organic matter concentration in the water. So what happened when the bleach finds the 
the natural organic matter in the water that can react with this organic matter forming THM. THM are different products. One of them is chloroform, and this is very toxic to humans. So if we ingest this uh, kind of products, we can have uh, health, um, these health problems can damage our organs in the body, like liver, kidney, heart, and several organs in the body. So they decided that they needed to get rid of the organic matter in the river. So in order to do that, they added this substance, this iron chloride. This substance is a coagulant. So the iron means the organic matter forming like coagulate that uh, this is part of the drinking water treatment. They add this coagulant in a tank, and then the organic matter deposits on the bottom of the tank. So that, that's why, it, that's how they get rid of the organic matter. But by adding this, they were adding chloride too. So the iron was, uh, goes with the organic matter, but they have the chloride in the water, a lot of chloride in the water. And this chloride can cause corrosion in the pipes, as your fellow said before. So with the previous uh, water source that was Detroit, Detroit was using phosphate to prevent the corrosion in the pipes. But these guys from River didn't use the phosphate because they were saving money, uh, in theory. So after doing that, and uh, the corrosion started, and General Motors has a plant in River, in Flint, sorry, and they stopped using the water because it was corroding the steel pipes in the plant. So, and that's the big problem, why they have this problem? Because they had pipes made of lead. Lead is a material that was used to make pipes for a long time since the Roman Empire. And in US, a lot of pipes uh, made in the 30s, 40s were made of lead because it's very easy to make, to make pipes with this material. But the problem is that uh, it can leach can leach in the, the lead can leach in the water causing this uh, health problem. So the EPA uh, is not allowing uh, drinking water systems to have uh, lead pipes anymore. So we can't find uh, lead pipes at the stores nowadays, but some of the many cities in US and other countries have uh, all water distribution systems with uh, lead pipes. They still have lead pipes. So. There is an interesting question here. If we still have lead pipes, why don't we have lead problems all the time? And why, why do you think we don't have lead problems? Yeah. Because they're coated in, in protective layer. Uh -huh. OK, cool. <coughs> Very good. So this was what Detroit was doing before. Detroit was using phosphate, adding phosphate in the water. And the phosphate reacts with the lead of the pipe, forming a scale in the inner surface of the pipe, which is like this. And this scale is protecting the pipe. So the pipe is not exposed directly to the water and to the this uh, bleach and other compounds in the water that can corrode the pipe. So this was what uh, the trade was doing that, but Flint stopped doing that, and that's why they had problems. So I'm going to explain a little. Uh, I don't know if you have heard about solubility product before in other classes. So you don't need to know a lot about this now, and River will explain this in unit seven, I think? Yeah, in the mental unit. Yeah, so what I want to explain now is that uh, there is an equilibrium reaction for a solid when a solid is in a solution. So for example, here we have, this is a solid that can dissolve either uh, constituents in the water, this is an equilibrium reaction. And the constant for this equilibrium reaction is called solubility product, is this. It's a fixed number, it's a constant. So by looking at the solubility product of a compound, you can know if this compound is soluble in water or is not soluble in water. So when you have a large constant, then the product, the compound is soluble. But if you have a very small constant, it's not soluble. So for example, we have two compounds here. This is lead chloride and lead phosphate. These two compounds, we can have it in the distribution, water distribution system with lead pipes. Because we have chloride and we have phosphate, if they are using phosphate in the system. So you have the solubility product constant here. These, they are very small, the both of them, but this is much smaller than this one. 
So by looking at this, what compound do you think is soluble in water? Which one of them is soluble? I said when the constant is very small, it's not soluble. So which one is soluble there? The first one. This is soluble, and this is not soluble. So that's why they were using phosphate, because by adding phosphate, the lead reacts with the phosphate forming this, and this precipitates over the, the pipes forming the scale. So this is the way we can protect the pipes from the corrosion. So that's why they use phosphate. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is the after. After they switch, they were not adding phosphate anymore. So they had the, this layer, it's called saturation layer, from the, before when they were using the solid water. But because they didn't use the phosphate anymore, this layer was dissolving over the time. So now they have the pipe exposed to the water. And they had a lot of chloride because they were adding bleach and they were adding the iron chloride. So they had a lot of chloride and the chloride, the bleach and the, the chlorine and the chloride can corrode the, the pipes. And also the oxygen dissolves ox oxygen in the water. And this has to, uh, this is related to the poten redox potential. I don't know if you have learned about redox reaction mm -hmm. before, and I think River will explain some redox mm -hmm. in right. unit seven, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, some, <laughs> a little, but yeah, you don't need to know like a lot now, but. So I want to show you the redox reaction. So when they have the bleach, the bleach is reduced to this, to chloride. And this is going to oxidize the lead from the pipes. This is not very good, sorry. They have the lead, this is lead zero, is going to be oxidized to lead two. And this lead two leach, leaches into the water, and that's why they have dissolved lead in the water. So this is related to the uh, redox potential of the chloride, of the bleach, and of the lead. And also the dissolved oxygen, this is very bad, sorry. <laughs> dissolved oxygen can be reduced to this. So this can also oxidize the lead from the pipes. So that is why. And this is another example with an iron pipe. Iron pipes can also have this problem. It's the same thing. This is you have bleach and you have dissolved oxygen. You can have the iron uh, oxidize the iron and the iron leaches into the water. And that's when you have the water red color in the water because of the iron. So they have pH issues as well. Detroit was keeping the pH of the water around 10. It's very high pH for the water. But they did that because they wanted to protect the, the scale inside the pipes. But the Flint uh, didn't do the same thing. So the pH was decreasing with time from, they started, I think, decreased from eight to this is like 7.3, something like that. So this was causing more problems. And this is related to the Le Chatelier principle River talked about before. In water, and you will learn this in unit three, I think, about alkalinity, the yes. water has carbonates. This is a natural uh, minerals in water, they have carbonates. The carbonates help the water to keep the pH stable. So if you add acid to the water, the acid is going to react with this carbonate. This is the acid with the carbonate forming water and CO2 and forming uh, bicarbonates and other substances. But the, these carbonates are going to react with the protons, with the acid, and help keep the, the pH of the water stable. So we, you don't have, we don't have problems with that. But because in this case, the pH in the flint water was decreasing, the protons, what happened when the pH decreased? What happened with the concentration of protons? The concentration of protons increases or decreases when the pH decreases. Yeah, increases. Yeah, yeah, increases. <laughs> yeah. When the pH decreases, 
decreases the concentration of protons in phases. So because of the Lysakos here principle, we, this is going to increase the equilibrium wants to be in equilibrium. So the equilibrium wants to deplete this excess of, of protons. And it's going to form more of these products. It's going to consume the carbonate. So the carbonate can react with lead in the water and form a solid. This is part of the scale. This is part of the perturbation like in the cycle. What happens if we are adding protons, the protons are reacting with the carbonate. This concentration of carbon is going to decrease. And because the equilibrium wants to be in equilibrium, it's going to form more of this because this is decreasing. And we want to have this constant. So it's going to dissolve the scale in order to go there, to form more carbon. So when the pH decreases, we are dissolving the scale. So this is bad for the water system. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, so this is another example. It's the same thing. If the pH decreases, the proton, what happens to the proton? Mm -hmm. Increases. The proton increases. This is another solid in the scale, lead oxide. If this concentration increases, the equilibrium wants to be in equilibrium, so it's going to go to the right. It's going to, because it wants, it wants to deplete this, it's going to react with this, so we are dissolving the scale. Okay. And what happens if the pH increases? When the pH increases, the proton decreases, and the OHS yes, increases. increases, very good. So if the pH increases, the OHS increases, and because the equilibrium wants to be in equilibrium, it's going to react with the dissolved lead, forming lead hydroxide. This is a solid that can be in a scale thing. So if the pH increases, we are forming more solids, more scale. This is good for us, okay? So that's why they try to have the pH uh, in a high, a high pH. And yeah, let's talk a little about the cost. You have watched the videos, they talk about that. Uh, they have damage in human health and also economic damage. So the EPA, after problems with methods in drinking water, established the lead and copper rule. This is uh, the safety uh, concentration of lead and copper in water distribution systems, drinking water distribution systems. So the concentration of lead that we can have in our water distribution system is 0 0.015 milligrams per liter. This is 15 ppb the PPV that we were talking about before. So this is the, the safe concentration. And they found in Flint 30,000 PPV of lead. This is the highest concentration they found. And they estimate from 6,000 to 12,000 children exposed to this concentration. It's very bad for children because they are developing their body. So they are more affected than us. And a microgram of lead per deciliter of blood in a children, in a child, can cause decreasing IQ, one microgram. They found 33 micrograms, the highest le level of uh, lead in children's blood. And they had economic uh, damage too. So in, these are some examples. In January 2016, the US government pledged 170 million in aid to the state of Michigan. Most of this money was to repair infrastructure to change the lead uh, pipes uh, to other pipes, copper pipes. They are used now, copper pipes. In August 2020, 600 million deal between the state and the residents of Flint that were harmed after more than two years of negotiation. And in January 2021, the news reported that uh, some authorities like the Michigan governor, health director, and other ex-authorities are going to be charged after the new investigations they are doing. So next week in the lab, we are trying to mimic the problem in Flint. This is the lab from next week. But this lab will last like nine weeks. Part of the lab, you are going to do it at home. But next week, we are preparing the materials that you will take at home. And you will, uh, but it's very easy, so don't worry. Okay. So you are working in groups of three people. So each group is going to prepare three jars, one per person, three jars with the phosphate that we want to use as corrosion inhibitor. We are 
going to, we are trying to create the passivation layer in pipes. We will work with pieces of pipes, but copper pipes, because as I said before, we can't find the lead pipes at the stores now. So we are working with copper pipes, but we can see the corrosion in copper pipes. So you will prepare the three yards with phosphate solution, and then another th other three yards with a mix of chemicals used in drinking water treatment, like the ones I talked before, like the iron chloride, the iron sulfate is also a, a, uh, it's a flocculation agent, the phosphate for corrosion control, the bleach, and we will uh, play a little with pH, so we will have different pHs and different concentrations of these chemicals. Each group will prepare a different uh, mix of chemicals with different pHs, so you will uh, have like a box, each one of you, you will have a box and you will take home one jar with the phosphate, one jar with the mix of chemicals, the pipe and some tubes to collect samples. And you will put the pipe first in the phosphate solution, have it there for a few weeks. You, if we are lucky this time, you can see the passivation layer because it has like a bluish color over the pipe. And then after a few weeks, you will change the pipe and you will put the pipe in the other yard with the mix of chemicals. You will keep it there for a few weeks and then you will be able to see the corrosion. This is very visible. And then you will bring back the materials to the lab. We will take samples of the yards and we will analyze the samples with an instrument that we have here to analyze metals in water. And you will see the concentration that you have of copper and other chemicals in the water. You will also collect tap water sample, samples for, from your tap water at home, and we will analyze the tap water samples to see if you are fulfilling the EPA lead and copper, copper rule. Usually you are good, but last semester we had three people not full with high levels of metals in their drinking water so at <laughs> from <laughs> so don't worry because this is not the, the common thing. And then with the data from the analysis, the concentration of metal dissolved in water, you will prepare a lab report, but this is like in November, so don't worry about it now. So for now, we are only uh, preparing the solutions, and you don't have a lab report for this lab. So it's only, it's uh, like the first one, so it's, it's very easy. You have videos, I will, you will, we will post more videos on ELMS, if you want to have more information. And this is my email, if you have questions. You can add anything. Okay. Yeah. So was like the lead sulfate um, solution like more expensive? Like why didn't they have enough of it? You know, the phosphate. You know, yeah. Why did they stop treating it that way? Because it's expensive. So if you are, you have to buy more chemicals to put more chemicals in a drinking in a water treatment. You are spending money, so they wanted to do the minimum effort. So that's right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.